All right, so we'll get started. Uh, good morning again to those who have joined. And I'm glad that David Moody from Ojai is joining us today to give a presentation, which will be followed with a question and answer session. So the way it would work is that he would give a presentation for around 45 minutes and then uh, what you can do is you can type your questions uh, in the chat box and I will formulate the questions for him. Uh, but if somebody is not able to type in the chat box for whatever reason, they can raise their hand. And we'll allow them to ask the question directly to Mr. Modi. Uh, so introducing David, he was the first teacher of uh, Ogro School. Uh, and I, if I understand correctly, when he started, there were only five students and slowly the school grew. And he had a number of interactions with Pishtamuthi at the inception of the school and throughout the first maybe 10 years or 15 years when, the, when Krishnamurti was around. And he's author of a few books now. He's writing some books in the last few years. One, one of them is Krishnamurti in, in America, New Perspectives on the Man and His Message. Uh, this book is uh, a biography more from the point of view of covering some of the Krishnamurti's life in America, which was missing from earlier biographies that were printed, uh, the official biographies, such as the Mary Littian's biographies and Upal Jayakar's biography was from the Indian perspective. So this uh, book, the new book uh, has access to much more data and information from the archives and it's quite well written book. Uh, he was the director of Ogro School for a number of years until Krishnamurti's death. And a few years ago, he had written a book called An Uncommon Collaboration, David Baum and J. Krishnamurti, uh, because he knew David Baum and Krishnamurti both quite well. And this book brings out certain uh, elements of Krishnamurti which David Baum was able to explain and elaborate in his own language. Uh, there is one documentary which came out recently, which is called The Infinite Potential. Uh, and this is available on YouTube. And this uh, documentary features David, Bo uh, David Moody also, where he is interviewed about David Baum and his work. Uh, related with not only science, but uh, related with the inner journey. I may have missed a few, uh, many aspects of David Moody because it's a long life and we cannot cover everything in few minutes. So uh, I would request uh, David Moody to begin his presentation. And if I miss something, he can add to that. No, no, okay, thank you, thank you very much. And um, no, you, I don't think you missed anything important. Um, can you hear me okay? Shall yes. I proceed? Yes, yes. Okay, so this talk, um, I'm, I'm not very familiar with, uh, you know, my audience, and I'm not sure whether or not uh, the things I have to say will be, um, maybe too elementary or obvious to some of you, or if it's um, maybe uh, it assumes a greater uh, familiarity with the teachings than you actually have. I, it's really hard for me to judge, but um, we'll just dive in and see how it goes. I would just, um, I'd like to start by saying that it seems to me that one of the most outstanding characteristics of Krishnamurti's teaching is its um, great originality. 
I feel the teachings are highly original, both in the overall uh, scope and content, as well as in many of the uh, particular details. I feel his, his philosophy cannot be categorized as belonging to any existing tradition or discipline or religion or any other school of thought. And I feel that what makes this originality uh, even more remarkable is that at the same time, the teachings are entirely factual. In other words, his originality is not achieved by means of some exciting uh, new theories or his uh, vivid imagination or some uh, captivating speculation. Instead, from start to finish, he's only concerned with describing facts and exploring the actual contours of human consciousness and relationship. So great originality combined with strict adherence to factual realities, I feel represents one of the hallmarks of, of Krishnamurti's teaching. And one of the features of his originality lies in his rejection of any kind of method for purposes of self-understanding or meditation or psychological transformation. And his rejection of method was not simply a casual or incidental feature of the teachings. Instead, it was something uh, very uh, carefully considered and central, integral to the whole structure and uh, meaning of his philosophy. So I don't think we can understand the substance of the teachings unless we also understand what he had to say about method and why he felt that any kind of method is counterproductive, antithetical to the uh, valid understanding of oneself. On the other hand, Krishnamurti did recommend a certain uh, activities, a certain kind of procedure that he felt uh, procedures that are conducive to learning about oneself. So in this talk, I'm going to explore the nature of those activities and try to explain why they are not any kind of method or systematic practice. And this whole set of principles and observations is what I'm calling Krishnamurti's methodology. And we'll try to see how this uh, methodology fits in the context of other forms of inquiry. So in order to understand Krishnamurti's methodology, I think it's helpful to begin from the broadest perspective and look at the most basic uh, kind of overarching principles of his approach. And one of these we've already discussed, and that is his insistence on uh, only being concerned with facts. Now, there's nothing, you know, terribly original about wanting to be concerned with facts, except perhaps for the complete rejection of anything other than facts. So Krishnamurti has no interest in or, or patience with theories. He has nothing to do with any form of speculation. In fact, he even uh, rejects ideals of any kind. He considers ideals to be fictitious and ineffective and really just a way to avoid dealing with facts. So... The strict adherence to facts as opposed to theories or speculation or ideals really represents one of the pillars of, of Krishnamurti's methodology. And another pillar is the complete rejection of authority in the psychological field. You know, the word authority is related to the word author. So authority means accepting the truth of a statement based upon who said it, the author of the statement, and accepting anyone as, as your authority in psychological matters means that you give up 
uh, seeing the truth of it for yourself, understanding for yourself. So remaining with facts and rejecting authority are two of the pillars of Krishnamurti's methodology. And a third pillar is to look at things objectively, dispassionately, without allowing your personal preferences to enter into your observation. Krishnamurti says you cannot see clearly if you allow your likes and dislikes to enter into what you're observing. So there's much more to be said about Krishnamurti's methodology, but I just want to pause here and point out that everything we've said so far is completely consistent with the way in which science proceeds. Because uh, science is also primarily concerned with what is factual. In, in scientific circles, you know, that's called being empirical. And in science too, it's very important not to accept anything on the basis of anyone's authority. You know, even if, if Einstein says something that's true, it's not going to be accepted even by Einstein himself, unless factual empirical observations can support it. And similarly, allowing your personal preferences to enter into your observations is considered completely impermissible in science. So in all of these respects, Krishnamurti's methodology is, is very consistent with established uh, procedures and, and principles in science. <clears throat> I think we should also point out another characteristic of these pillars of Krishnamurti's methodology, and that is that each one corresponds with what he calls the negative approach or negative thinking. Krishnamurti says, don't be afraid of the word negative. What he means by it is negating that which is false. And he says, negating what is false is the most positive action. So he says, negate authority in the domain of self-understanding. Negate personal preference, all like and dislike when it comes to clear observation. And giving attention only to facts means negating theories and speculation and even ideals. So with that in mind, I think we can dig more deeply and try to um, address one of the most central issues in Krishnamurti's methodology. And that is, as we said at the outset, that he negates uh, any form of method or system of practice in the psychological field. And when I say he negates it, I mean he, he discards it, he puts it aside because it's false. And I think in order to understand his whole philosophy, we have to understand not only the fact that he rejects methods, but also understand why. And it seems to me that the rejection of methods is most conspicuous in Krishnamurti's teaching when it comes to the issue of uh, meditation, because he considers meditation to be very important in life, but he feels that any method or system of practice is uh, contrary to the spirit of, of true meditation. And sometimes he's really uh, rather uh, scathing in making this point. Um, I read one place where he referred to transcendental meditation as transcendental nonsense. And when it comes to the repetition of a special individualized mantra, for which people sometimes pay hundreds of dollars, he says that you might just as well repeat Coca-Cola over and over in your mind. He feels that any uh, highly repetitive practice of that kind really uh, only dulls the mind and has nothing to do with uh, true meditation. But Krishnamurti's rejection of method goes far beyond uh, techniques for the practice of, of uh, meditation that really applies to the entire field of uh, inquiry or investigation into consciousness or self-understanding. So 
uh, now we'll we'll try to look at the essence of his uh, objection to method and the psychological field. And uh, I'd like to begin by looking at the basic nature of all methods, of their intrinsic characteristics. First of all, any method uh, contains within it a a goal or objective. Uh, a method has no meaning without a a goal to be a, achieved. And secondly, any method is always a process that takes place through time. It's a technique for moving us from where we are now to some other place in the future. And the future necessarily entails a process in time. And thirdly, any method is really basically a mechanical in nature. By mechanical, I mean it follows a preconceived blueprint for action, you know, a blueprint which is available to be followed over and over if necessary. And so all of these characteristics, the goal or objective, the process in time, and the mechanical nature of action, all of these are, according to Krishnamurti, completely contrary and counterproductive to any uh, valid, meaningful understanding of oneself. So this is what I want to explore and find out why he feels that way. So let's look at each one of these characteristics in turn. If I have a psychological goal or objective that I want to achieve, it means that I'm dissatisfied in some way with what I am now. I have a concept in mind of something more or better that I would like to become. So right from the beginning, there's a division in my consciousness between what I am and what I think I should be or become. Now, that division in consciousness is itself one of the most crucial things that Krishnamurti's teaching is designed to overcome or resolve. He considers psychological division of any kind to be dysfunctional because it always leads to conflict. According to Krishnamurti, where there is division, there must be conflict. He calls that a law. And it's so basic to his teaching that I have sometimes referred to that as Krishnamurti's law. Where there is division, there must be conflict. So any form of method in the psychological field uh, intrinsically uh, creates a division which makes us be engaged in conflict. Now, the second problem with methods, as we said, is that a method always involves time. It's designed to cover some distance between where we are now and some other place to be achieved in the future. And that gap entails a process that occurs through time. And that brings us to another very fundamental issue in the teachings because Krishnamurti maintains that there's two very different kinds of time. One is what he calls chronological time. And that's just the ordinary kind of time that we're all familiar with. That's the kind of time that we measure with a clock or a calendar. And Krishnamurti has no problem with it. He considers it to be an obvious fact of daily life. But Krishnamurti maintains that there's another kind of time altogether. And he calls that psychological time. So the distinction that he's making works like this. He says, time is a measure of movement. So chronological time is the way we measure movement in the outer world, the world of uh, physical objects in space and time. And psychological time is the way we measure movement inwardly. It represents the distance or the movement between what I am and what I would like to become. And according to Krishnamurti, that kind of time is, is entirely illusory. It does not really correspond to anything actual. It's just an invention of thought, he says, that does not really measure anything that actually exists. 
Now, this is a subtle point because we don't always recognize or acknowledge these two different kinds of time. But Krishnamurti says it's crucial to understand this. He says, time is the enemy of man. And when he says that, he's referring to psychological time. As I said, he has no problem with chronological time. But he maintains that psychological time has an entirely different quality. He says it's illusory. And the fact that we live in that illusion represents one of our, our most basic fundamental difficulties. So Krishnamurti objects to methods in the psychological field, first of all, because they create a division and therefore conflict between what is and what should be. And secondly, because they engage us or involve us in psychological time, which is illusory. Now, the third thing about any method is that it's fundamentally mechanical in nature. That means it follows a, a preconceived blueprint for action. And Krishna really maintains that any uh, mechanical action can only produce a, a mechanical result. Or to put it a little bit differently, uh, what is mechanical operates in the field of, of cause and effect. Now, Krishnamurti does not deny that there is such a thing as cause and effect in the psychological field. For example, he says fear has a cause. And if we can understand the cause, we can eliminate the effect. But he says there are other elements in the psychological field that don't operate in terms of cause and effect. In particular, he says, truly understanding something is not the result of any cause. Insight and intelligence are functions of the mind that don't function in terms of cause and effect. And above all, perhaps, he says, love has no cause. So a mechanical procedure, procedure can bring about a limited, localized, a superficial effect in the mind, but it cannot produce something more fundamental, such as insight or intelligence or love, because these are not the result of any cause. So these are the reasons why Krishnamurti maintains that there does not exist and will never exist any method sufficient to bring about fundamental change in the psychological field, in, in human consciousness. So just to be clear, nothing we've said um, applies to the use of methods in the external world, the physical world of objects in space and time. You know, if we want to achieve some result in the external world, it's perfectly appropriate to have an objective in mind, something to be achieved in the future, to have a mechanical procedure to produce that effect. And so we, you know, we plant seeds in the spring in order to harvest in the fall. And there, there's cl clearly nothing wrong with that. But then we attempt to transplant that same kind of methodology into the psychological field, and there it doesn't work in the same way. There it is ineffective at best, and very often becomes very dysfunctional, as Krishnamurti has, has uh, you know, gone to great lengths to, to point out. So now we're going to switch gears and look at this from another angle, because we've seen that Krishnamurti rejects methods, and we've seen why, and so then that raises the question, well then what does he recommend? He's calling for change, and he says methods cannot produce the kind of change that we require. So then what are we to do? Just give up and say nothing can be done? Or 
does there still exist in Krishnamurti's methodology something we can do that will facilitate or precipitate or help us discover a psychological transformation? So in order to understand what we might think of as the more constructive or positive elements of Krishnamurti's methodology, I think it's helpful if we look at this in another context. Because we've shown that the whole issue of using methods in, in Krishnamurti's teaching is uh, problematical or challenging. And I think it might be helpful to point out that the conventional field of psychology also has a great deal of difficulty with methodology. And if we can understand that, I think it will help us see the genius, really, the very original and insightful way that Krishnamurti deals with this whole issue. So when I refer to the conventional field of psychology, I'm talking mainly about how psychology is studied in uh, serious research and professional journals. And to understand that field, I think we have to realize that psychology aspires to be considered scientific, a form of science. But psychology labors under the burden of being considered what is called a soft science, like anthropology or sociology, instead of a hard science like physics or chemistry. So the hard sciences are the model that the soft sciences aspire to become, so like physics or chemistry, psychology you know, aspires to produce hard knowledge, highly reliable facts and theories, thoroughly tested and uh, statistically validated. But there's a fundamental problem with trying to turn psychology into a hard science, because in physics or chemistry, if we perform an experiment and publish our results, it's not enough for the field to simply accept those results. Instead, our experiment has got to be repeated or replicated by others in the field to see if they come up with the same results. And this is considered a very basic fundamental principle of, of scientific procedure. And that standard or expectation to produce results that can be repeated or replicated by others, it represents a high bar and a challenge even for the hard sciences, but it's much more difficult in the soft sciences like psychology that study human beings because the phenomena being studied in psychology are inward events and phenomena like thoughts and feelings and motivations and memories. And so it's very, very difficult to create the conditions for experiments that can be repeated by other investigators. Now, in the very early years of the discipline of, of psychology, these issues had not yet come into prominence. Um, in the United States, uh, William James is considered to be the father of the discipline of psychology. And his approach relied in part on the process of introspection. That means he considered it perfectly legitimate to examine his own states of mind, his own mental processes, to come up with evidence for the principles that he described. But within a few decades, the process of introspection as a means of obtaining reliable knowledge um, fell into disrepute. It was considered unscientific because what I observe in myself can never be observed by anyone else. And therefore it becomes impossible to uh, replicate my findings. And without replication, the model of becoming scientific just goes completely out the window. And this is considered a crucial issue because with 
introspection, I might fall into self-deception or my observation might be uh, colored or biased by my personal preferences. After it all, it's, it's myself that I'm looking at, so I'm not at all disinterested in my observations. I might see or discover only what I wish to see or whatever makes me appear in the most uh, attractive or favorable light. And as a result of this dilemma, the field of psychology went to the opposite extreme from introspection. The fields went so far that it stopped even attempting to study anything that could be called mind or mental processes. It, instead, it declared that the field of psychology simply represented the study of behavior because behavior was something that could be observed objectively, independently by different investigators. So this approach to psychology was called behaviorism and it became extremely influential throughout much or, or most of the 20th century. Now, we've already seen that Krishnamurti's methodology has a lot in common with scientific procedures. His approach is committed to facts, not theories or speculation. He has no use for authority or accepting anything just because somebody important said it. And he insists on complete objectivity and not letting personal preferences interfere with observation. But at the same time, his methodology calls for something that looks very much like introspection. He says fundamental change, psychological transformation is a matter of understanding oneself. And such understanding can only occur with close and careful attention to one's own thoughts and feelings. So we have to ask ourselves, is Krishnamurti fooling himself by adopting this strategy? Because the discipline of psychology has said, this doesn't work. Conventional psychology has said, we have tried this and we have seen that any inward observation can never be objective. It will always be vulnerable to my likes and dislikes, my personal preferences, and nothing I discover there can ever be considered reliable. So at this point, you might think that Krishnamurti would disagree and say, you know, oh no, I'm sure we can look inwardly and be perfectly objective about it. We just have to bear in mind that it's very important to be dispassionate and unbiased, and then we can do it. We can, we can go ahead and proceed and everything will be fine. But in fact, Krishnamurti takes another approach entirely. Instead of rejecting the possibility that inward observation might not be objective, he totally embraces that possibility. In fact, he makes it central to his whole methodology. He says, watch what happens when you look at yourself. You will see that you're always evaluating what you see, judging it as good or bad and trying to shape your observations according to some preconceived standard. So discovering and learning about the way our personal preferences enter into and distort observation is a critical, fundamental feature of Krishnamurti's methodology. However, he doesn't just stop there and leave it at that. And this is where he goes beyond conventional psychology. So the next step also reveals his originality. He says that if you see for yourself the fact, the reality that your judgments are distorting your observation, then you may begin to look without that kind of interference. So we have to go slowly here because this is a crucial point. So, Let's say we're really serious about understanding ourselves and we realize that requires that we give 
close attention to the inward flow of, of thoughts and feelings. But Krishnamurti warns us that when we start down that path, our observation is going to be clouded because we're going to see things in ourselves that we like or dislike. And every reaction of that kind, saying uh, this motivation is good or that feeling is bad, has the effect of distorting whatever we're trying to observe. So this is where Krishnamurti's originality comes into play because he maintains that it's possible to overcome or go beyond this tendency to evaluate whatever we observe inwardly. But that does not come about by resisting or trying to do anything about it. Instead, it comes about by sheer awareness. What is needed, he said, is simply to see for yourself the negative effects of those judgments, to see the absolute fact that it distorts clear perception. So he says that very awareness is the solvent in which that kind of judgment may be dissolved or dissipated. So psychological change is not brought about by trying to do something. It doesn't come by exercising effort. Change is brought about by understanding, by seeing what is taking place. It's the actual understanding of what distorts observation itself that is the factor that eliminates those distortions. Now, Krishna really doesn't want you to just take his word for it. He doesn't want to function in the role of anyone's authority. So he says, try it out experiment. Learn for yourself how to observe without allowing your personal preferences to interfere with your observation. And if you're able to go this far, then you may arrive at the place that Krishnamurti calls choiceless awareness. When he says choiceless, he means an awareness without condemnation or justification. That's how he describes the meaning of, of choiceless in this context. But it's not something you can do just by resolving to do it. You cannot simply decide to stop condemnation or justification. It will only happen if you see for yourself the fact that it actively interferes with clear perception then and only then that kind of interference drops away. So choiceless awareness is not a method. It's not a procedure that you can follow to bring about change. In other words, you cannot choose to engage in choiceless awareness. Instead, it's just a factual description of the state of mind that is necessary in order to observe clearly. So it's something to understand, not an ideal intended for us to live up to. So now we've described some of the essential elements of Krishnamurti's methodology. We could go into greater detail, but I think that's sufficient for the moment. And so now I'd like to switch gears again and look at how this interacts with or is woven into the rest of Krishnamurti's philosophy, because his teaching does not exist solely for the purpose of expressing this methodology. So now let's look at the whole of Krishnamurti's philosophy and see what role the methodology plays in the big picture. So let's try to state very briefly, very succinctly, what is the general content or subject matter of Krishnamurti's philosophy? What is the overall theme or thesis for which the methodology exists? 
And I think we have to begin by pointing out that Krishnamurti addresses the whole field of life, including all of consciousness and human relationship. And within that field of life and consciousness, he observes a great deal of conflict and disorder, which includes sorrow and grief and confusion and violence. And he also says, if you look closely, you will see that that same conflict and disorder exists within each one of us. And so he says, what can we do about the disorder that exists within ourselves? So how can we bring order and intelligence into our own consciousness and relationship? And he says, order and intelligence will only come if you understand the nature of disorder. If you want order, you have to examine and understand what is disorder. And to really examine it directly, you have to see it as it functions within yourself. So this is where the methodology comes into play because if I myself am the source of conflict and disorder, or if I'm a participant in the general disorder, then what can I do about it? And Krishnamurti says, there's nothing you can do in any direct way. There's no method that will correct the disorder in human consciousness. All you can do is learn about it, be aware of it, and understand it. It's the very understanding of disorder that is the beginning of order. So he says, learning about the disorder within oneself begins with the sheer observation of yourself in daily life. You observe your own behavior and all the circumstances of daily life, and you notice the thoughts and feelings that produce that behavior, which includes awareness of your own motivations and intentions and desires. And as you do this, Krishnamurti says, everything depends on how you watch. Can you observe yourself choicelessly? That is, without judging any of it as good or bad, because any evaluation will distort what you see. And only if you see yourself clearly without distortion will you begin to understand the disorder within yourself. So Krishnamurti uses the word self-knowledge to describe this entire process. But what he means by self-knowledge has quite a different quality from what he means by knowledge per se or knowledge in general. He often points out that knowledge per se is part of thought. It's a record or repository of the past. And he says that the whole field of knowledge has characteristics that we don't always acknowledge or recognize. We have a tendency to feel that, you know, we, we tend to feel that, that knowledge is unlimited or potentially unlimited and that it can solve almost any problem in life. But the Christian really maintains, no, knowledge is always partial, always limited, and it cannot solve the most important problems in life. But self-knowledge has a different quality or character in the way he uses those words than knowledge in general. Self-knowledge is more like self-awareness. It has to do with learning, but it's a kind of learning that doesn't get accumulated or stored up. It's an awareness or perception that occurs moment to moment. It's always moving or flowing because what you're observing which is your own thoughts and feelings and motivations and actions, is itself a, a process that is always in motion. So all of this that we've shared today is kind of a general introduction or orientation to Krishnamurti's methodology. You know, what we've said, of course, is no substitute for seeing how he discusses these issues himself. But 
Krishnamurti doesn't always give a lot of attention to these issues or go into it in a very systematic or comprehensive way. Instead, his observations about methodology uh, tend to get kind of woven into the fabric of his talks rather than taking center stage. But if you examine his teachings over the course of several decades, I think you'll see that in the earlier years, he used to give more attention to these issues. And when I say earlier years, I don't mean going all the way back to the 1920s or his theosophical days. I'm talking about the period right after World War II and into the 1950s and 1960s. And during those years, he tended to be more explicit about choiceless awareness and self-knowledge and the kinds of issues we've been talking about here. And I mention this because when he was more explicit about it, Krishnamurti often acknowledged that choiceless awareness or the process of self-knowledge is not an easy or obvious thing to do. In fact, the word that he used most often to describe this process is arduous. He said it's very difficult and a lot of hard work. It involves being aware of your thoughts and feelings all through the day on a daily basis. And you have to be very earnest and diligent in his words to do something like that. And I think it's important to point this out because in Krishnamurti's philosophy, an activity that is difficult and hard work is entirely different from what he calls effort. Krishnamurti objects to the exercise of effort. He insists there's no effort involved in awareness or self-knowledge, even though it is arduous. So to really understand this, I think we have to get clear about this distinction between what he calls effort on one hand and hard work on the other hand. So the way to understand what Krishnamurti means by effort is to know that he associates effort with an act of will. And you exercise your will when you have to overcome some kind of resistance. You know, the exercise of will occurs when you make a decision to take a certain action. You formulate an idea and you tell yourself to obey that idea. That's the nature of will. And that's what Krishnamurti calls effort. And he maintains that you can never arrive at understanding or change through the exercise of your will. He says, that's a form of division. It represents an inward conflict. One part of you is telling another part what to do, even though you may not really want to do it. But your will says that you must. So Krishnamurti considers this kind of thinking to be a prime example of disorder. It's the kind of thinking that his whole philosophy, in a way, is designed to expose the falseness of. So Self-knowledge, which is the clear, undistorted observation of yourself, does not come about through effort, which is an act of will. So it's another kind of action that is required. Rather than effort, which is based upon an idea, what is required is an action that is based on perception of facts, perception of what is. It's an action that your whole being, your whole brain and nervous system is involved in. You do it because all of you wants to do it. You would have to exercise effort in order to stop yourself from doing it. But that doesn't mean that it's not hard work. It's very hard work. It's arduous. You have to be serious, earnest to engage in it. So... You might ask, where does the energy come from to engage in all this hard work if I'm not exercising any form of will? And the answer is that it comes from observing the chaos and disorder of the world that we live in. 
it's that perception of facts that gives you the energy to investigate, to inquire, to find out what is the source of the violence and confusion and selfish, destructive behavior that is so widespread in, in human society. So I just want to address one more issue before we bring this talk to a close, and that is the issue of time. You might think that time is sort of boring and mundane and not very relevant to understanding consciousness and relationship, but Krishnamurti shows that time has important consequences and unintended effects that we often don't realize. So Krishnamurti says you cannot rely upon time to understand what he's talking about which means to understand yourself. He's very emphatic about it. He says, time is not required for psychological transformation. In fact, he goes further. He says, if you do rely upon time in order to change or understand, then you will never understand or change. And I feel like this kind of statement is, is maybe easy to misunderstand. It kind of sounds like he's saying, Either you understand the whole thing right this minute or you'll never get it. But I don't think that's what he really means. Because when Krishnamurti talks about time, it's important to remember his distinction between ordinary chronological time and what he calls psychological time. We discussed this a little bit earlier. If I form an image of what I am and another image of what I want to become, then psychological time uh, represents the interval required to move from one image to the other. And Krishna really maintains this kind of time is illusory because those two images don't really correspond to anything actual. Each image represents a kind of a fixed point. And in the psychological field, there are no actual fixed points because everything is always in motion. So the whole program of trying to improve myself through psychological time is based on a false premise, a faulty understanding of what I am. So it is thinking in terms of psychological time that is the impediment to understanding oneself. So I don't think Krishnamurti is saying that chronological time is any kind of obstacle or problem for choiceless awareness or self-knowledge. He says self-knowledge is hard work, and that means work that takes place through ordinary chronological time. Sometimes he even says, take time to study these matters, to examine them every day. So I think it's helpful to bear in mind this distinction because sometimes Krishnamurti refers to time by itself without making clear that he's really referring mainly to psychological time. So as we said at the beginning, Krishnamurti's philosophy is highly original. It cannot be placed into any category or discipline or school of thought, and his methodology is also original. And I think the central issue in his methodology is the discovery of what is the true nature of psychological change. Fundamental psychological change does not come about as the result of my deliberate intention to do something, to change myself. That's the way change works outwardly in the physical world, but not in the inward psychological field. Inwardly, change occurs as a result of seeing, awareness, understanding, insight, or rather it's not so much that understanding brings about change, but rather insight, understanding is itself the transformation of consciousness. And that I think is the key principle of Krishnamurti's methodology. So I see that um, it's taken a little longer than I anticipated, but I think we still have some time left for um, 
talking things over, questions. Am I right? Yes, very much. Yes. Uh, so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so we have covered a, a wide field of Krishnamurti's teachings, uh, not only the methodology, but the context in which this word methodology is used. So I feel that we have plenty of room of discussion. Uh, so, so we'll have this in the form of question and answer where we pose a question and you can respond because we don't have opportunity to interact with you every day. So we'll use this opportunity to get your responses to certain questions. So let me see how do we start here. So the first question is, uh, in our daily lives, one sees there are numerous thoughts and feelings that come to our mind in interactions with others throughout the day. So where does one begin? Because you are saying that it's arduous. So where does one begin? Because there are so many thoughts and feelings. You, you start uh, at any time and stop at any time. It's, there's no, there, there aren't any rules in this field. You, you start when you feel moved to start, when you, when you inwardly, you see the um, reason for it and the necessity. You know, here's the difficulty because, you know, what we do, we, we our minds are mechanical and we hear these things and we create an idea out of it and then we tell ourselves to obey that idea. And already, we're, you know, we're kind of lost in terms of what the approach that uh, Krishna really wants to um, engender in us. And I frankly, I think that's one of the reasons why he doesn't talk about these issues as extensively as he might, or as he used to do, um, because we do take these ideas and principles and, and then, you know, form that into something to live up to. So it's it's not a question of finding a, a rule or a principle about where to start. You start when when you're moved to start. You start when you inwardly you have that sense of the rightness of the reason, the appropriateness of doing it. And then it happens of its own accord. You don't have to make yourself do it. You do it because you want to do it because you see that it's a right and reasonable thing to do, and that it's the it's the basis for living intelligently. Okay. Okay. Now I'll pose a question, which is has to do with your theme, uh, which is Krishnamurti's methodology. Uh, so, uh, why did you choose the word methodology, and how is it different from method? Because in your beginning of your presentation, you talked about the limitations of methods, such as setting a goal and having a future in mind, or something that you mechanically practice. Uh, so how do you make the distinction between the word method and methodology? Okay, right, that's a fair question. And so, um, you know, the, the choice of the word methodology that's just um you know it's just a uh, a word that i found uh convenient uh, for this purpose it, you know if somebody really objects to it we can throw it out and approach it differently but i the way i use that word and the reason i use it is it goes like this so your method is the set of procedures as i said it's it's like a blueprint for action it's a set of procedures that you follow in order to bring about a certain result. A methodology, the way I'm using the word, is, uh, is your attitude towards method. It's your observations and relationship to the whole question of method. So if your attitude and relationship to method is that no method is appropriate in the psychological field, that's your methodology because that's that's what you observe and what you think and um, what you have to say about the issue of method. So methodology is not a method per se. It's your set of 
attitudes and principles regarding methods. And I also like the word methodology because, you know, as I pointed out, Krishnamurti does have a certain kind of approach that he recommends. He does discuss certain procedures or activities that we can engage in. And I think the me word methodology is, it, you know, it's a broader term. And so it embraces these um, procedures that Krishnamurti, um, you know, kind of recommends, even though um, he's very careful to distinguish it from uh, uh, any sort of systematic practice or, or blueprint for action. Right. So uh, you mentioned about William James uh, suggesting introspection way back at the inception of the field of psychology, but uh, that introspection can also have a certain amount of conditioning. Uh, and I may be just moving within the field of my conditioning when I'm introspecting. So, uh, so when Krishnamurti uses the word introspection, how is it different from say William James? Uh, one distinction I could see is that in order to um, say go beyond one's conditioning, Krishnamurti also uses questioning to really question your assumptions, your beliefs and so on. So, uh, but are there any other distinguishing factors in introspection the way Krishnamurti uses it? and maybe the way William James used. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, Krishnamurti has discussed this occasionally uh, in some of his talks. He's addressed it very directly. And the way, and he uses the term introspection in a particular way. He considers I can't remember exactly how he puts it, but he considers introspection to be very much of a method. So he already objects to it on that basis. He considers it a method uh, in which you um, analyze the past uh, in order to achieve a certain purpose. And all of he, so he objects to all of that um, and he, distinguishes all of that from choiceless awareness, which, um, you know, choiceless awareness, as I said, means choiceless means without condemnation or justification. And that's where the conditioning comes in. I think Krishnamurti would say that when you evaluate what you observe, it, it's your conditioning, which is doing the evaluating. So, so it's so for it to be choiceless is is in a sense for it to be for your awareness to be unconditioned and it's a very you know if you have tried it it's a very challenging thing to do because we do um, we do very strongly um, evaluate what we observe inwardly because we have we have motives we have intentions we have conditioning and and. So when he says that, um, you know, if you watch, you will see yourself engaging in that process. He's right. It, it comes up um, frequently. Okay. Yeah, because uh, Krishnamurti also would use, sometimes reject words that have been used uh, by others in a different way. So he would come up with his own way of expressing it. So that doesn't necessarily mean that he rejected the whole thing entirely. No, I completely agree. I think that the word introspection could be used differently than the way he uses it, but he defines it to mean a certain thing. And then he, he goes to some length to say that, you know, that's not anything that he would recommend. Yeah. Now there's one question here, which says that, uh, how do I know whether the, I really want to make a change or not? Whether uh, whether I have the actual or real desire to change? What if I'm just bluffing myself? Because the change may be very disturbing. You know? Change may not be so, so comfortable. Uh, what we imagine change, uh, a different way of living, uh, 
may not be so comfortable as I think it would be. So am I really serious about it? I think that's the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's very valid. And I, I don't think there's any easy or obvious answer to it. But I think that um, for me, the way to answer that is you, you know, at this moment sitting here now, um, I might not be able to answer that about myself. But as you go, you know, through the course of your day and you watch your own thinking process and you watch the, um, how you formulate things that you would like to do, um, you can begin to see, you know, what's behind it. Um, but it's, you know, it's an observation which occurs in the moment. It's not something where you can necessarily sit down and say, okay, I'm going to decide whether or not my um, interest in change is valid or invalid. I mean, you might be able to do it that way, but to me, I think it's easier to discover when you just watch yourself in daily life and things think you will find yourself thinking things and wanting things, um, you know, as you go about your, your daily business. And I think that's where the, uh, where you realize, you know, what lies beneath your intentions, because it, it's a very good point. What you think your motivations are may not be. There's, uh, Christian really often refers to levels of consciousness and, you know, what, what is um, underneath the most um, explicit level may be rather different than what appears on the surface. So it's a very valid question. I don't think there's any easy answer. It just, it requires watching and observation during the course of daily life rather than sitting down and thinking, okay, I'm gonna resolve it once and for all. Okay. So now since I think you have also written a biography of uh, Krishnamurti, uh, there's a question which says that Krishnamurti had some personal difficulties also in relationship. Uh, so I'm wondering how this can happen to a man who talks about choiceless awareness. Yeah, um, yeah, there's no doubt that um, he had uh, a long series of um, very serious difficulties. Uh, they mostly revolved around um, the two people that he was closest to as a young man and it took him uh, decades to kind of extract himself from that whole situation. So this is really this is one of the um, one of the main reasons that I wrote the book Krishnamurti in America because these difficulties in his relationships were um, brought out very strongly um, in the book by um, the daughter of the people that he had trouble with. Um, you know, the people that Krishna really had trouble with were uh, Rajakapal and Rajakapal's wife, Rosalind. And Rajakapal and Rosalind had a daughter, Radha, who grew up uh, with Krishnamurti uh, in that environment where they all of those people were living together and she observed a great deal of him personally and um, and so she she wrote a book which described all those conflicts from the point of view of her mother and the point of view of Radha's mother Rosalind was very critical of Krishnamurti and claimed that he was um, uh, kind of two-faced, um, hypocritical, all kinds of things. And based upon my reading of that book, my own experiences with Krishnamurti and what I read and um, the other biographies, I felt this was an extremely false and um, distorted picture of Krishnamurti's character and his relationships. But Radha kind of had the feel all to herself because when Mary Lutchens came out with the original, you know, authorized biography, 
it didn't include very much about Krishnamurti's life in America. And similarly with um, Pupil Jayakar's book, which is a you know a marvelous book and tremendously insightful and detailed, but it it also does not go into very much about Krishnamurti's life in the United States. So when Radha, Rosalind's daughter, wrote all the things she wrote, she was talking about things which had not been discussed very much in the previous biographies. So I wrote Krishnamurti in America in part to refute the whole point of view that uh, Radha expressed and to, to answer this question, how is it possible for a man with you know, Krishnamurti's insight to be involved in such difficult relationships? And I don't think there's any short answer. I, I wrote the book in, in order to kind of explore and expose this. Um, but I would just say that you know, having um, a good quality relationship with someone, you know, it depends on both people. You know, uh, if somebody is aggressive and intolerant and um, bullying, uh, it, it, you're not going to have a good relationship with them no matter what you bring to the table. There's going to be problems. So the challenge for Krishnamurti was um, how to cope with people who were behaving in that manner without um, reciprocating in kind and in a way that would preserve his own uh, peace of mind. So I mean, that's just a very short answer to a very complicated question. But if you're really interested, um, Krishnamurti in America explores the conflicts and difficulties that arose in Krishnamurti's relationship with Rajakpal and with Rosalind. It goes into all of that in great detail, including not only their personal interactions, but also there was a whole series of lawsuits that the Krishnamurti Foundation was involved in, explores all of that at length. And so that book is, is the best way that I can answer or uh, you know, try to address that question. Yes, I think what you said is true that his, apparently from, when we look from outside, it looks very complex, the kind of uh, difficulties he had. But also I think your book, book also brings out that Throughout this period, uh, Krishnamurti also had this inner freedom uh, in which he was functioning and operating, yeah. which is not so apparent, which is not easy to see. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. In fact, um, you know, the longest period of time in which the three of them, Krishnamurti, Rajkwal, and Rosalind, um, all lived together on the same property was during World War II because Krishnamurti couldn't travel and Raj Kapal moved his, his uh, living quarters from um, Los Angeles back up to Ohio where the others were. And yet it was during that period, even though there was a, quite a bit of tension and conflict with Raj Kapal and later on more with Rosalind, but it was during that period that Krishnamurti had some of his greatest insights. It's my impression and this is something else I go into in that book that, uh, you know, Krishnamurti's understanding of a consciousness reached a, a different depth, a different level during those um, years during World War II when he wasn't traveling. And, uh, you know, as you said, he, he maintained his own peace of mind somehow in the midst of that um, potential a conflict. Okay, so the next question is, uh, how can we be aware when we are observing that we are actually observing or we are observing with distortion? Is there any kind of a test that we can have for ourselves? That are we actually observing or observing as things are or 
uh, are we observing with distortion? Again, this is one of those questions where the, you know, there's no rule or formula, but I think it's something that becomes apparent to you as you watch. It's just sheer watching that will answer that question for you. Um, but I would also say that I think that what Krishnamurti is trying to say is that you're going to have um, reactions to things and feelings and emotions, and then you're going to evaluate those things. You're going to judge them as good or bad, and it's those judgments that represent the distortion. And if you watch that happening in yourself, you will see it. It's the, you know, choiceless awareness means, means awareness without judging it, which is a very difficult and subtle thing to do, but, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you can imagine um, uh, observing something that, um, you know, maybe is not even alive, like uh, observing um, um, molecules under a microscope. You wouldn't, you would, you wouldn't impose any kind of value judgment on anything you observed. You would just want to observe it and see how it functions for its own sake, or, you know, it could even be something alive. You could be watching um, little organisms, or it doesn't have to be under a microscope. You could be watching um, baboons or chimpanzees in the field. And you, again, you wouldn't judge their behavior. You would just be watching it objectively to see what is it, to understand it. But when we bring that same observation to ourselves, it's much more difficult when we are observing ourselves or people who are close to us, then we do evaluate, we do judge, we do see things in terms of good and bad. And that's, Krishnamurti is saying that it's at that place where the distortion comes in. So that's what you have to look out for and see how those judgments are, are distorting your, your clear observation. Okay, thank you. So one more, question here. Uh, if one is living a very uh, planned life uh, uh, with a lot of planning and so on, does it inevitably bring about psychological time also? Uh, and then is it necessary to take a break from that planned way of living? Uh, I, I feel the person is asking if one has a job and there is a routine, then is, does it inevitably bring about a psychological time. So does one need to take a break from that in order to get away from this psychological time? I don't think there's anything in ordinary life, including going to the office, uh, living according to a, a chronological plan, I don't think there's anything in, in that which necessarily entails what Christian really calls psychological time. You can, you know, if the bus comes at a certain hour and a certain minute and you have to catch it, you do. If you are working all day and you clock out at the at the at five o'clock, that doesn't necessarily entail psychological time. But psychological time is going to come up in your consciousness for other reasons. Um, so I don't think it's, it's conforming to a schedule that is the problem. I think you can conform to a schedule and the problem of psychological time, it, well, it's going to occur anyway, but it's going to be independent of that uh, planning and schedule that you um, you have for practical reasons. Practical life can occur independently of these um, problem with psychological time that Krishna Murti discusses. That's my understanding or my impression of it. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of hands raised. So I will remind people for asking the question to keep it brief. Uh, and just 
go directly to the question if you can. So Abhay, could you ask the question? Yeah, sure, Gurvinder. Uh, thanks, sir, for this uh, quite perceptive talk. I have a quite a sort of a technical question. I would keep it very brief, but uh, it really uh, makes me ponder at times very strongly when Kay talks about choiceless awareness without involving the role of evolution in that. So just bear with me for a few seconds. I'll put up my thought uh, as precise as possible. So when I am in my subjective conditioned self, I am existing in a certain mental state, right? I am, I am again reiterating this statement that when I am in my own subjective conditioned self, I am in a certain mental state and that mental state has a direct correspondence with the brain state, right? So there is a brain state which corresponds to my conditioned self at that particular moment. Now, K's law, because I also say it is a Krishnamurti's law, observed is the observer. It happens because this conditioned brain state gets in coherence with what is getting observed. So there is a state of super, superposition happens and a singular state comes up, which makes observed is the observer, which is what K is continuously saying that observed is the observer. Because there is a state of coherence, which has established in the brain states actually at a quantum level. Now what happens is this subject now wants to go into the process of decoherence to enter into choiceless awareness. Because this subject cannot enter into choiceless awareness unless and until the brain state corresponding to this subject gets into doing coherence with the observed brain state. Now, what puzzles me when I read K around this is K says nothing that if I want to create a decoherence between these two brain states, my own subjective self and what is observed, where is the energy I should bring? for this decoherence to emerge. Only evolution can give me this energy to establish the decoherence. But K is saying, no, you don't need evolution for that. You keep on, you keep on negating, 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 because negating is nothing but establishing a decoherence in the brain, actually, if you look at it in that way. But even if I'm doing negating, negation and negation, at some point of time, there is a very high likelihood that I will again going to caught in my own self brain state because this negation will not going to remain biased for a very long time. Decoherence, which is, which is the fundamental material requirement to establish in choiceless awareness, I'm surprised where I should bring this energy from, if not evolution. Please help me out. Okay, well, uh, I would just say a couple things. One is um, when you talk about evolution, uh, to me that the term evolution is a little bit confusing because I associate it more with, um, you know, biological evolution. And I'm not sure how that fits in here, but also that what also why I would have difficulty um, really responding to this is is you're bringing in questions about the um, actual state of the brain. I assume you mean, you know, at a cellular level, things going on in the cells of the brain. And for me to try to get into that area and try to see how that um, connects or is incoherent with the psychological phenomena, I, I don't, I wouldn't know how to address that. I, I would be guessing, I would be speculating and, and I don't see for me, for my understanding of Krishnamurti's teaching, it does not fit really within the framework of his teaching, which is the only thing that I'm trying to talk about. So that's a very long and roundabout way of saying that I don't, think I know how to answer that question. Okay, so next question, Shekhar, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, David, uh, for this elaboration. In fact, I heard you on the May in uh, Ogro School uh, 
at Ohio yeah. <laughs> on the same subject. Yeah, I was around that. Uh, maybe I turn this in a more rather than a question uh, into a dialogue uh, uh, piece. I think uh, whoever goes seriously into the K uh, with our own intellectualization, we try to harden few of them as a concepts and the methods. Uh, though on one side cases are no, any, against any of the discard any kind of methodology uh, but I like your approach you know you are tra you're trying to shake even that what we try to make uh, you know when we move away from something but we again take the K and idealize that and crystallize that into another yeah, kind yeah. of idea so Absolutely. your approach of <laughs> your approach is quite interesting in a way to break that and still look beyond uh, yeah. thanks for that uh, do uh, contribution and because you take a very contrary stand on that, you know, in, in the traditional case approach of uh, there's no methodology along with that. I appreciate that. I mean, that's a way for all you kind of, you know, make us to to take a step back and, and, and look at what's the real spirit of that word when he says no methodology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I have a you know other question because I saw that you were you know, closely associated with Dr. Baum and uh, Case and your book on it. Uh, what was what's your observation or your view on um, you know when K wants Dr. Baum to kind of uh, come over and take take those dialogues and those discussions for him to to probably I think he has come closest intellectually to kind of uh, grasp what K was kind of a pointing it out and uh, and a lot of Dr. Bohm's work also tells us how we could be able to understand in a broader sense from a scientific mind uh, what Kay was talking about. Uh, but I think he's one of those who come very close, close to, to, if I may use the word, a state from where Kay speaks. Uh, but for some reason, Dr. Bohm never kind of, you know, went ahead on that, he brought it almost to the peak and uh, uh, it, it's, what's your observation on this? It is to, when you probably observe them closely and uh, uh, what, 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 what could have been Dr. Baum's response in the later years and even after the case uh, stuff, it would be great to kind of hear because you are probably very few who are around uh, with that direct experience of uh, both these uh, people. It would be great to hear it up. Thank you. Yeah, well, you raise a very interesting question and uh, it's, a, it's a puzzle. And I certainly, I'm, I, I can't, you know, give you the absolute true and uh, ultimate um, answer to this. I can only tell you my own uh, impressions because I've also, you know, pondered uh, those same issues and, um, I, I tend to agree with you that Bohm uh, had, you know, the best, um, you know, Bohm maintained that he was making a map of consciousness. And he's, you know, he said, you know, that you, you, we must be careful not to confuse the map with the territory. But nevertheless, he made a, a, an exceedingly um, detailed and uh, clear and coherent map and he made such a good map that in some respects, you know, uh, sometimes it seems like better than the map that Christian Rudy made uh, in certain respects. It was a very, very good map um, and, and went into a lot of, you know, he had his own colorful way of expressing things. He would come up with um, metaphors and examples and things that Christian Rudy would never uh, have anything to do with. So it made for a very uh, appealing and uh, interesting way of expressing some of the same points. But um, yeah, I don't, my impression was that, um, my impression was that Bohm's evaluation of himself was that he did not uh, fully understand it. My impression is that Bohm felt like his own understanding of the psychological field was incomplete. And I think this for a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons I think this is because 
you know, the, the, what survives of Bohm's views in the psychological field is mainly just that um, one book, Thought as a System, which came out, which is a transcript of the dialogues that he conducted in Ojai after Christian when he died, transcript of one of those dialogues. But, but that book is a transcript of dialogues. It's, it's not a comprehensive, systematic, orderly presentation of the whole of his views. And Bohm was such a good writer, I always used to um, urge him to, you know, commit his views on the psychological field to writing, to write a book that would express his views um, more clearly than really came out in the dialogues, even though the dialogues are very interesting, the transcripts very interesting. And he always resisted that. And I couldn't get entirely clear why he resisted it, but I think the reason which he kind of suggested at times is because he felt that his understanding was incomplete. And he just, he didn't feel prepared to enter into that territory in the, in the way that is implied by actually writing a book that he was okay with conducting the seminars. He was okay with the transcript of the seminar being published, but to sit down and commit himself to writing, he didn't want to do it. And I think it's because he himself felt that he, his understanding was incomplete. But again, this is speculative. I, I really don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. A lot of people have wondered and debated this, and it's it's quite possible that it's just uh, not accessible to anyone's full understanding. Okay. So next, uh, uh, I have one question, which is uh, that throughout Krishnamurti's teachings, we see that he gives various pointers for uh, looking in, into oneself. Uh, for example, I'll read a statement. Uh, he says, I, I will tell you the shortest way. Do you want to know? It is just to observe and end. That is, to observe so that there is no observer. To observe without the past. So it's a, a pointer to observe. So would you consider these pointers as Krishnamurti's methodology? Definitely. The, the, as I understand uh, that quotation, it's very similar to saying, observe without condemnation or justification. It's the condemnation or justification, which is the action of the observer. That's where the observer, it's the observer who says, oh no, you shouldn't think that. Or by God, I'm, I'm right to be angry. It's the observer who says all that. So to say choiceless without condemnation or justification is another way of saying without the observer. That's how I understand the whole thing. So, so the, what you, the quotation that you've given seems to me completely consistent with what we've been talking about, but it puts it in different language because it brings in the observer, which, uh, you know, that brings in another dimension, which is a little bit, um, beyond or, or deeper than what we've been discussing, but it's definitely part of the same, the same uh, kettle of fish, you might say. Okay, so in, in other words, one can use these, uh, one can look at these pointers, and these pointers can become a, a way to take our introspection, you know, uh, in a deeper sense, where you know, one, one then comes across these pointers. One can introspect and see how it is actually operating in us. Yes, introspective, introspecting in the sense of a sheer observation, not in terms of that, what Krishnamurti means by introspection, which is analytical with a objective in mind and, uh, you know, processing, you know, your childhood experiences, that kind of introspection no, but the kind which is it more in the nature of sheer observation. Yeah, that's that's what, what it's all about. Yes, okay, one more question from Suma. Go ahead, Suma. Um, thanks, Dr. Modi, for taking this question. So um, when you use the word method, or you use the word methodology as, as were, uh, 
uh, are you sort of moving away from the pure exploration of case teachings into a domain or space which is uh, which involves scholarly interpretation? Because there's something sort of not very clear uh, with attributing methods to a man when he has frankly uh, uh, he has treated methods as conditions, right? If uh, if there are conditions that enable truth, then we call can we call it the truth? Because K always talks about truth as freedom from conditional knowledge. So I'm not attributing methods to Krishnamurti's teaching. I, that's what I tried to say. I, when I use the word methodology, I don't mean to attribute methods to him. What I mean by methodology is what is his attitude or relationship to methods? And Krishnamurti has a very, very clear and well-developed set of observations and principles with respect to methods. So it's the reason why he objects to methods that I'm calling methodology. That may be a confusing use of the term methodology, but that's how I'm using it. I don't I don't mean by methodology a method, I mean the attitude towards methods, which in Krishnamurti's case is don't have it, don't have a method in the psychological field, but it also includes his reasons why you shouldn't have a method in the psychological field or can't, why it's ineffective. That's what I mean by methodology. Well, I think that's fair enough because even Krishnamurti had a freedom to use words in a certain way, which is different than the normally understood. So I think you have clarified how you are using the word. Uh, okay. So Rajin, then go ahead. Uh, hello, hello, Dr. Moody. Good evening to you. It is uh, yeah. wonderful to hear you talking for uh, all these things. And it is very, we are very grateful to you. Just I want to ask one simple question. Uh, many of our friends who are following Krishnamurti were telling his teachings very, very, very difficult to understand. It is not practicable. Uh, like that, uh, some complaint was there. But I, uh, but my understanding is that Krishnamurti always was telling us, "Don't accept what I say. Just to uh, uh, investigate, experiment, and test it in your daily life. Then only you can understand that whether this." He experimented in, uh, and tested his statements. He made thousands of statements. If you take the, all these statements, if you one of the, if you take one statement and experiment it and test it in our daily life on our own light, we may be able to understand his teach, what he says is obviously uh, true. Do, so whether do, do you think my, whether my Understanding is correct. They experimented and tested uh, in our day-to-day -day life. He was he is told in more than 150 occasions was uh, uh, recommending this. He was uh, telling this, and that is a tool I think to understand his uh, teachings. He experimented and tested in our daily life. What what's your uh, what do you consider whether this uh, my uh, understanding? Sir? There's no doubt, you know that. To, that when we say understanding Krishnamurti, there is no understanding Krishnamurti other than understanding ourselves. Uh, underst right? That's how he put it. He said he's a mirror to for us to look at ourselves. So saying that I understand Krishnamurti is is only to say that I understand myself. The two are are one and the same. And to understand myself absolutely it's in the it's in the field as you say of experimentation trying it out observing uh what's going on in, in my own daily life so all of that is true on the other hand there's another aspect to this and that is that some of what krishnamurti described even though he you know, it's meant to be a mirror in which we can see ourselves. It's hard to see in ourselves. Even though you can follow it intellectually, it's difficult to see it directly within oneself. And this has to do with what I was saying about the originality of the teachings. My feeling is that um, Krishnamurti is extremely original. 
even though there are points of contact between what he says and what various other people may have said at various times, if you take the teachings as a whole, they are extremely original and they, uh, there are elements and themes which come up where it's not easy or obvious to see the truth of it for oneself, even though you may have some intellectual understanding of it to make that leap, you know, from the map to the territory, uh, it's not easy. And so I think that, you know, when people say that they have trouble understanding Krishnamurti fully, I think it's a valid concern. Um, I think that's why, even though Krishnamurti is a source of great truth, he's not better known in the world he hasn't made a greater impact because it's not obvious how to follow his statements and see how they apply within oneself. It's, it's quite a challenge because what he's pointing to is, is very original and very unlike what we are deeply accustomed to. I think I'm going to have to, um, it's nighttime here yes. and getting past my bedtime, I'm sorry to say. So yes. I'm going to have to, to call it quits here pretty soon. Sure, sure. I think uh, we have uh, no more questions from the uh, group. So I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank you on behalf of everyone here for giving your valuable time. And we hope to have some more interactions with you in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I thought the questions were marvelous and, and I really appreciated the process. And thank you for having me. I appreciate you listening to all of this. Great. So we'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.